Hello and welcome to part two of this very special edition of the Blue Monday podcast. I'm still Craig Fimbo and joining me again is Ipswich Town legend George Burley and this time to talk about his managerial career. So George, early days were up in Scotland in in terms of your management career. You were player manager at at Ayr, is that right? That's right. Um, Once I sort of finished my career, finished my career, I was... Uh, looking to get into the coaching and the uh, managerial side. Um, I did my full licence um, at Lillishaw um, okay. in my late, latter days as a player. And and when I was doing that, I met um, John Gorman, actually, uh, ah. a good friend of mine and um, you know, a lovely lad. And he invited, said, come to Gillingham and play for a season. And that. so I played for a season um, and did all my badges. Then the opportunity was to come go to Scotland. Um, I, and Tommy McLean invited me to Motherwell. Um, he didn't he didn't know me that well, but um, Jim McLean um, had been working with Scotland uh, when I when I played, and I think Jim recommended me, so I went and worked with Tommy, and um, really enjoyed it. Uh, played there for a couple of seasons. Um, you know, we did quite well. Um, wasn't a bad team. Scotland, Rangers, Celtic, and then the rest are trying there. But <laughs> Tommy was an excellent coach, uh, good knowledge of the game, and, and I enjoyed working there and picked up some things. Then my hometown, um, Air United, uh, yeah. asked me to go there. As, uh, I was still playing, still playing with Motherwell. Um, so I went there as um, player manager. So uh, I was going back home, really. So back to see my mum and dad and, um, you know, and people, my brother and the usher. Uh, so that that was different, and then, so um, the wife and family chugged up north um, and lived wow. up there. And then in in June 1994, you moved down to Colchester. How on earth did a move to Colchester come about? As you say, you were you were up in Scotland and the family were up there to move back down to the east of England. Yeah, we moved, but um, we always wanted um, to stay in England. Um, but sometimes you've got to move away to come back. So I always wanted to to come back. Uh, my 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 wife was um, from Dunmo in in Essex, and and she's got a, had a family here, and and and, and we we lived here you know, like fourteen years as a player. So we wanted to come back to Ipswich. Um, got an interview at Colchester, and yeah, and I think I was still playing, <laughs> and I think me been playing as well would would help to get the job. And um, lucky enough, um, they. They, they offered me the job uh, then, so back back to um, the southeast again. But only briefly at Colchester, though, yeah. So you you signed for those in, or you know, you became manager in about June '94, and then come December time, you're not doing badly at Colchester. Um, but there's no way you're ignoring a call from from Ipswich, is there? Can you remember the story behind that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you say it was short periods, which I really enjoyed. We were doing well. I think we were fourth or fifth in the league. Uh, things were going well. Um, Ipswich, you know, um, were looking for a new manager. John Lyle had left, um, and I got the call. And um, I knew the people at Ipswich very well. Knew the directors, um, John Kerr. I knew his dad very well. John, his dad Willie Kerr was a director when I was a player, and they they lived. Um, he he used to live locally and come up in the Ayrshire around the other a family. Okay. Um, had a couple of in- interviews. Um, Colchester gave me permission to speak to them. So once I spoke to them, and then they were keen to take me. Um, it was an opportunity where you know it came up. Um, my, my my club was a player, and uh, where we lived for so long, uh, there was no way I was going to turn it down. A hundred percent. And the coach defends weren't and what we now twenty. 20- <laughs> <laughs> seven, 27 years on, they're not still not particularly happy, are they? Well, I've been back a few times. I went <laughs> back when John McGill was a manager a few times. I did a lot of work with John. Um, so, uh, yeah, 
But I mean, it was it was the compensation was uh, the the problem. I mean, Ipswich offered them decent compensation. Compensation they wanted more. So uh, and and it eventually went to a tribunal, um, and they got um, much for the same money that um, I think um, Ipswich were offering. But um, it was a big decision. Coaches and fans weren't happy, but. You know, it was, it's my life, and it probably the only chance I get to to go back to my, my club, and and something I couldn't refuse, and and it's not nice leaving somewhere uh, where you've, where they've gave you the opportunity, but in trouble troubles in football, um, you, if it comes, um, you know it, it's not a long long period you're, you're usually there for, and it's something you can't you can't just say uh, turn your back on. Well, that's right. You know, it's if the shoe was on the other foot, it only takes a handful of bad results, and then the decision's not yours to make, is it? I suppose. Well, I mean, I think time and tell has told that at Colchester, isn't it? And um, yeah, you know, I was you know very dis- disappointed to um, let John McGill go because he was doing a terrific job, and and Gareth Williams, who was yeah. doing a terrific job. So, but that's football. That, as a manager, you know that can happen. And the other hand is, as a manager, if you've got the opportunity, I think you've got to take it. Yeah, absolutely. So the the Ipswich team that you inherited, that they're in a bit of turmoil, weren't they? They were bottom of the league, seven, eight points adrift. Was it? You know, were you coming in with your eyes open? Was it a, a lost cause pretty much by the time that you joined us? It was difficult. Yeah. Um, it was a difficult time for the club. A uh, difficult time to take over. Uh, there was not going to be any short term answer. Um, the Premiership is unforgiven. Um, the club's done, done well. John Lowell's done well to get them into the Premiership, but um, you know changes had to be made made at some point. And um, so it was, it, you know, it was a test for myself. Um, and 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 I knew it, it would take time because when you move into a club, normally you can't say right, we're going to change twenty players here. <laughs> normally it doesn't, <laughs> but um, it's something. It was it was a. Uh, it was a job where I wanted it. There's no way I was going to turn it down, uh, and I was going to give it everything to make it right. And, um, and certainly, that, that's what I tried to do. Brilliant. Well, it didn't take long. I think only a handful of days after you joined, we we went to Liverpool and got our first ever away victory. I think it was, wasn't it? Adam Tanner scoring one um, nil. I think we won up there, um, and then yeah. we played Manchester United away. Do we want to talk about uh, Manchester United? Yeah. Well, that was another difficult one, wasn't it? It was <laughs> one where it can happen. We've seen it happen before in that Premiership. Man United were a fantastic team. And we were low in confidence and just kept conceding goals. Um, and it was one of these where, as a manager, you've, you've got to you know, take it in the chin and move on. Um, and after the game, I went and spoke to Sir Alec and he was appreciated I come in and spat and then and I had to move on from it. And um, it wasn't pleasant, but again, it was a test, a test of your character, a test of your ability to, to pull it around after that. Yeah, of course. So we ended up getting relegated and then from there, it's, as you said, it's, it's a rebuild, isn't it? Do you, do you remember were you any under partic- any under under any particular restrictions or pressure to you know immediately get back up or was it always agreed that it would be a, a slow build progress? Well, you, you can't you, you, you can't say how long a football is going to take or how long you're going to get. So as I say, you've got to try your best. Um, I think you know, I knew I knew the club, I knew most of all the people, um, and I was um, knew what I was looking for. And um, I think they appreciated that, and it was um, a case of you know, trying to change things as quick as you can, trying to get your players in, trying to get a system. It's like anything. Um, whether you know, I think it was, I think it, it was almost 100% we we're going to get relegated. Yeah. So that wasn't a surprise. Um, okay, we lost that nine nil. That you know, that was a you know a kick in the teeth, as you say, which you've got to you know book you know get back into uh, work in order because that takes time to recover. But um, yeah, I think you, you believe in what you had. You believe in your, your methods. Um, I, I felt that I was brought up the best way, Ipswich, in the academy, and the Sir Bobby. I had my training routines. I had my standards. I knew what I was looking for. And it was a case of me, yeah, 
believing I could do it and and getting things right. Well, I say we'll we'll try not to go into minute detail on each each season because we've only got a certain amount of time. But I think people will be fascinated about the just the build really of of the squad over over the course of the of the years and you know the reasons behind it. So hopefully we'll do it justice. Um, one of your first permanent signings in the in that new season, so 1995 going into 96, was Tony Mowbray in October. You uh, you knew what you were getting, didn't you, when you signed Tony Mowbray? Yeah, well, I've, I've seen Tony play a lot. Uh, I knew his character. Uh, I was looking for somebody to, you know, build round, somebody with um, a great character, um, somebody that had the ability and the know-how uh, to teach players as well. Uh, I was wanting to bring young players through, so it's important you have the right role models and the right people with... Um, my sort of ideas, and then um, spoke to Tony. Tony was in a bit of a low uh, at Celtic. Uh, yeah. Had a good chat with him, uh, and I think Tony felt he just wanted um, a new start. And um, lucky enough for us, he decided to come. And um, you know, I don't think he regretted one moment of it. No, I don't think he did. And as you, and as you say, and as you said in the in our previous chat when we talked about your playing career, about just having the right sort of characters. In the te- in and around the team, you know, not only to bond together, but also for the for the youngster to look up to. And you can't really have much of a be- have much of a better one of uh, than Tony Mowbray, can you? Really? Well, that's right. I think any team, you know, look at uh, Sir Bobby's. You know, we, you know, we brought experienced players and you know, and Mick Mills, and uh, you know, we got Alan Hunter, who, who came into the team from Blackburn, and, and it's very important. And and I've always in, enjoyed bringing young players through. And I think that was my strength, and uh, I always liked to be a worker because even when I would play, any young players were about I used to work with, and uh, young players coming into the club. So that was something I always looked for. And I think for a club of size of Ipswich and the other clubs I've been at, it's so important. It's so important you bring these youngsters in and and give them more opportunity and and work in the you know the frailties and make them better. And then, and then encourage it, and it encourages other youngsters, and and it's great for the, the local community seeing these youngsters getting the opportunity, and that's what I had, you know, 15, you know, and Vuxley played non-stop from 17, so I, I think um, that that's a tradition at Ipswich, and that's something I wanted to keep going. Well, it's it's perfect because that's that self same season. It was James Scowcroft's debut season. It was Richard Wright's first real season. He played a couple of games the season before, but that was his first real season of men's football and these these guys were still still youngsters weren't they and it's obviously you, know, you talked about sir bobby in the in the previous chat about his and as you said that he's trusting the youth but that, that obviously rubbed off on your own management definitely oh definitely i mean that's um, so i always said the best players i signed was the youngsters you know the yeah. young players coming through um which you, which i think for a club that's how you're building you're not building for the future just keep buying players, you know, and and we didn't have the finances anyway. So you, you're buying players in, and sometimes those players you've got to sell, uh, and and that that's a reality. Not them all, but at times you've got to sell a player now and again because they they want to move, and, uh, but you bring money back into the club so that you can get other players in. Yeah. So it's a case of that sort of you know enthusiasm to keep that academy going, and I was very close to the academy. I used to. Pick the, you know, the academy director or the kind of people would recommend a player to come professional. And then I would go and look at them and then decide whether we were going to sign them professional. That doesn't happen anymore. You know, the first team manager doesn't really get involved where, like Sir Bobby and like myself, you'd hands on with everything. And the academy was so important for me. Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the features of our time in Division 1 was our runs that we, we went on from time to time and I think this season we had a 10 match unbeaten run and finished seventh just outside the playoffs um the following season 96 97 we finished fourth and lost to Sheffield United on away goals but again we only lost four of our last 25 matches you know so again it's these these little runs that appear talking about youth Kieran Dyer's debut season was that season um Mauricio Tarico, one player of the year. Now, from one 
great fullback to another who should know what what were his particular traits and also was it actually a pleasant surprise to have him on the books because you know he was a a makeshift afterthought really of of the of a bigger deal coming over from South America wasn't he yeah I think uh, Mauricio like a number of foreign players took a little time to settle um I know uh, the beginning of pre-season I think we played pre-season and get sent off or uh, something and Mauricio had a wee bit of a temper and he was quite <laughs> strong and I think my first season you're thinking well is he going to be you know you know what we're looking for but then once uh, pre-season um, got over he came into the team regular at left back and he was outstanding Mauricio was a lovely lad but he's very competitive <laughs> I say he would kick his granny if he could. He would really, but you know, in the right way. Well, I don't know what the right way is. But, uh, <laughs> he's very competitive, and he, when he got the ball, he never gave it away. You know, he, he was a great defender, and he, you know, and you talk about um, defending the back post. I mean, I used to think I was fairly good at defending the back post because as a defender, you're going to come against these six foot two lads, six foot three. But if you can use your body to block them or, or stop them off, that's what you do. And Mauricio was great at that. But he was a very good footballer, never gave the ball away. He would come and join in. He's got plenty of enthusiasm. He was a winner. He wanted the ball. And he, he, he was great for us. But it did take him a season to settle down. But after yeah. that first season, he never looked back. And then, of course... I think everybody was disappointed uh, we went to Tottenham, including the whole staff and myself. But finances at that time, we had to sell a player. And yeah. um, unfortunately, Mauricio was the one that um, we had the offer for and um, we had to let him go. But he, he was a terrific, terrific. You know, I've seen him a few times. He's a lovely fella, yeah. but he's a, he's a real winner. Yeah, and he and he went on to play almost as many times I think for Spurs as as he did for us. So you know he's he had a had a wonderful wonderful career. Yeah, he's a lovely yeah. lovely little player. Um, but then as you say about having to sell to then reinvest and bits and pieces like that. Moving into the the following season, which is ninety seven ninety eight, he then signed someone who's we spoke about just now. Um, Mark, when we spoke about Tony Mowbray, Mark Venus came in the building and Steve Sedgley moved out. That wasn't a bad bit of business, was it? Yeah, well, um, you know, the way it was, we had to bring some money in each season, and so you're 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 wheeling and dealing. And um, Mark, we'd watched, and he had a lovely left foot, lovely left foot, very good in possession, which suits us. And um, Steve, I think was you know he's getting a bit unsettled, and um, and we had a good offer for him. So Steve Steve went in one direction, and we were paid. Um, Hundred and fifty thousand for taking Vino, and I keep, <laughs> and I keep reminding them about that. We, you actually paid to take me, son, uh, <laughs> and he, he loved it. And um, Vino, I think we gave Vino wings because we wanted him to play, and that's what Matt went. Yeah, I'm centre half, but I can play and I can do that. And so we we had a little formation where we had Vino on the left, Tony Mowbray there, and eventually John McGreal, whatever. Um, and it worked well because he's, you know, great left foot, intelligent lad, wants to play all the time, and we had 150,000 in our pocket. Yeah, and and as you as you were saying about earlier when talking about Tony Mowbray, he and Mark Venus have you know formed a, a friendship which is still and a partnership which is still going on to this day. Yeah, it's great to see that. I'm really pleased with him. I seen Tony uh, a few months ago, and uh, yeah, he's doing really well there. And another another guy that um, signed a similar sort of time was a gentleman called Matt Holland, and we've spoken to Matt. He's he's been on the pod and and had a chat with us, and I've been to a, a Q and A with him as well. And he's he's joked that he was a particular favourite of yours after he <laughs> after he joined. A little bit of a golden boy, but was that eight hundred thousand pound well spent at the time for a twenty three year old? He was he was a an old an older sort of um, stature in a twenty three year old's body, wasn't he? Yeah, I remember going to watch him at Bournemouth. Um, I went with Charlie Woods, and um, yeah, you go and watch, and you're thinking players, and we, we you know, 15, 20 minutes go past, and I'm looking to Charlie. Half hour, I said, Charlie, he'll do me. His attitude and his commitment was first class. 
I think Mark played full back as a youngster at um, West Ham. Shows you maybe didn't quite get the opportunity. It goes to Bournemouth and he was born as captain when he was 21, 22. Phenomenal character, 100 percenter, you know, leader, and um, yeah, we 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 paid that for him and well worth it. And he certainly did a fabulous job for us at um, Ipswich. But again, as you say, it's just it's another one we were talking about Tony Mowbray. It's the characteristics, isn't it? Again, not just the playing side of things. It's that having that characteristics as well. Yeah, yeah, Matt. Matt did really well, and he actually <clears throat> playing along people like Jim Magilton, who might be a commentator, made him yeah. a better player because um, it brought him out of his shell a little bit, you know. And we tried to work on his passing as well, you know, which improved. So it was a case of yeah, he's good, and he came from West Ham. But Matt, yeah, with that character and attitude, you'll get better. And he went from strength to strength. That's funnily enough, actually, you you talk about the passing. There's reminded me in the Q and I went to. He was talking about your golf clubs, golf club um, <laughs> clubs of, for, on, your, on your foot. Exactly that. It's exactly yeah, what well, he was talking. Well, well, Mark, when he first came, only had a bit free, and he, <laughs> and he eventually got the lot. <laughs> brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Well, he he actually won Player of the Year in his first season at the club as well, which you know just just goes to show what an impact he had straight away. Um, another one that joined us in November, David Johnson. Now, crikey. Over a million pound was a was a lot of money for us back then, wasn't it? But he was a great goal scorer at that level. But did, what was the story? Can you remember the story about Kevin Phillips and missing out on Kevin Phillips beforehand? Well, I remember Kevin um, again. I went to see him at Watford with Charlie. Really, another one with great attitude. I mean, little lad, very sharp, eye for goals. Really liked him. We wanted to sign him, took him up to the office, talked about contracts. You know, we looked as if you know, we could do it, but they they were wanting a lot of money, and the only way we could get him was just going to a tribunal. And um, and I think the club felt the money they were asking for, and if it went to a tribunal, we probably couldn't afford it. So that yeah. But Kevin, for me, was another Matt Holland. His attitude. Uh, was tremendous and would have done a, no doubt, would have done a great job, but unfortunately it didn't happen. No. Uh, David um, um, was always a goal scorer. He had a bad injury at Man United uh, with his knee. He'd recovered for that. He was sharp, strong, knew where the net was. And um, as you say, did a really good job for us. Yeah, I think he got to over 20 goals, I think, that season in the league, in the league alone, which... Uh... Which is fantastic, and that wasn't just just that season alone. Was he? He was consistently banging in goals every every single yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic player. No, but, I mean, like any team you need a goal scorer. Yeah, uh, that, that's something. You know, if you lose one, you need to keep looking to to get in. And if you get get that, and you know, you've got a chance of winning games, so it's, it's a fine balance. And, and they're, they're always the most expensive. Yeah, but then you say uh, we said about David Johnson's. Um, you know, fee being over a million pounds. But during the course of the season, as you're saying about having to bring in funds to to release funds, you sell, you're selling Tony Vaughan, Craig Forrest. We spoke about Steve Sedgley. You're bringing in over two and a half million pounds, which again, this day and age, doesn't sound like an awful lot. Yeah. But back then, that's a that's a good chunk of money to be able to, as you say, just reinvest and yeah. and cover the gaps that you need to be filled. I think the finance at those times were losing maybe about a million pounds a year, you know. So it was a it was a balance of the wages. You wanted a team, you want to get promotion, but you've got to balance it with a million. So whatever way you look at it, that's how it went. And uh, we managed over those years to balance it very well by selling, but we also had money to bring back in. So if you sell somebody for four, you could pay three. You know, yeah. so it's uh, it was a balancing act, and uh, something it's not easy, but um, we did quite well with it. Yeah, brilliant. And we were talking about run the runs that we went on. I think this season in particular, our last twenty matches, we got fifty one points from our last twenty matches, which is absolutely yeah. ridiculous, isn't it? Um, I think of those, there were the five home games where we scored five goals in consecutive three consecutive home games, Huddersfield team called Norwich and and Oxford but in, in terms of styles of play that's 
every manager's dream is to produce a team which can play like that on a consistent basis. We were purring, weren't we? Yeah, I think managers judge by results, of course, and uh, but you've got to play a certain way. Our, our game was passing. Because that's what we do in the training field. I couldn't I coach any other way. So yeah. you know, people like your, you know, Mark Venuses and that coming to the club and and making players better at passing the ball was so important. And that and you have that have, have that belief the way you play will win games. You're no good playing that way if you can't win a game. So you've got to introduce passing, passing. So there's an end product. There's an end result. There's a shot. There's a cross. There's a header. You know, the, there's a side foot into the net. So you, you're working in a, a shape, a plan, a way of playing, but there's got to be an end result. Yeah. Um, so we finished fifth, um, unfortunately lost 2-0 to Charlton on Agri, I think, in the playoffs, two 1-0 um, defeats um, in the playoffs. But again, it's, it's another build, isn't it? And the following, <coughs> excuse me, 1998, that's when we sold Tariko. We also sold Alex Maffey, brought in another two and a half million pound. And that enabled you to buy Jim McGilton, who signed in March. And he's another guy who's, well, you know, you and I have spoken for an hour about your playing career. We're going to speak for about an hour about your management career. Jim McGilton, I think, spoke to us for about 12 or 13 hours about <laughs> one one particular game, I think. Um, but what, what, did, what did he bring to the squad and, and as you said before how well did he dovetail with with Matt Holland yeah I mean Jim was a footballer Jim was um, very infectious enthusiasm and actually pulled the ball out of people you talk about Jim Jim never stopped speaking on the, on the pitch you know and he he would say to Matt get the ball and give it to me Matt or get the ball and give it to me so you're style of play is going to come through your playmaker like Jim and Jim was so good at getting the ball you know he, he would take up angles and get the ball or if it's a one yard pass or a five yard pass he would get people on the ball so they get them on the ball to give it to Jim or give them, then go forward so his enthusiasm and his knowledge made a big influence to the team like I said it improved Matt Holland it would help the strikers. It would help the back four to get to to give some to the ball because he was always available, and that was Jim's game. And he had great vision and great touch, you know. And he and Jim made you play, and that was um, so important for the for our style of play. And when we spoke to David Johnson, funnily enough, we spoke to him, and he said that in, even in training, having Jim Jilton in training just lifted everyone else's what well, his expectations of everyone else were up, so therefore you had to raise your game even in the training, which then transfers itself onto the pitch, doesn't it? Yeah, it's habits. Jim couldn't do anything else. You know, Jim wanted the ball, he wanted to play, whether it was head tennis before you actually trained, or you know, or or having a meal in you know in the restaurant, you would hear Jim yapping away and <laughs> with Diary's accent and you know, it was infectious. And that's you know, and he, he loved football and he was at Sheffield Wednesday and he wasn't in the team. Yeah. And, and Jim was like Vino. He wanted to get out and play football. He just wanted the ball and wanted to play. And both of those two were very, they were very close as well. They were always arguing with each other, mind you. You know, and Vino's never wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Jim's never wrong. And, and as a manager, you've got, yeah, it was a little bit of a subtle touch because you yeah. could e- easily, you know, fall out with either two of them, especially Jim. But Jim was great. He was football mad. He wanted to play, and you let him play and let him whatever was fantastic. And that, and and we, you know, we sort of dovetailed well. Yeah, fantastically. And again, yet another character to bring into squad. We're, t- we're now building. You've got a good, solid core of of characters, as we were saying, as we were saying before. Um, so we finished third by one point. That was to Bradford, Paul Jules Bradford, I believe. Yeah. Um, and lost to to Bolton on away goals um, in the playoffs, which was Kieran Dyer got two goals, and that was his his last match, which we'll we'll come to in a sec. But having was there were there any thoughts after you know another heartbreak in the playoffs? Were there any thoughts that promotion this is no, this is never going to happen, or were there was there any pressure from David Sheepshanks or above that you know we need to start getting over the line? Um, when I look back, um, there was disappointment. Um, but there was a belief. Um, David was tremendous. 
Um, David loved Dipsich. He loved his football. Uh, very knowledgeable about the game. Um, never tried to interfere at all. Uh, would be there for you to speak to things about and um, any, anything about football. You know, but with um, great support. Uh, and I'm sure you know, some of the fans, whatever, were disappointed. But I felt that there was always a belief um, in the fans and the club that yeah. we could get it right. And, um, you know, and David and the board knew that um, we didn't have the resources and we had to sell, but I knew that we were so close. So that, that was great for me as a manager to have um, full responsibility to do things and nobody trying to, you know, you know, stop this or stop that and just give you encouragement. And, um, you know, and John Kerr was the, was the same when I took over. Um, so that, that network of players was the same behind the scenes. Yeah. There wasn't a divide between the academy, you know. You know, you, you didn't have a divide between the academy and the first team or the board or the directors. So we were all one. And that, and that made it so strong. And it made me and all my coaching staff feel, yeah, we'll keep going here. And the fans thought, yeah, we've got a chance. And if you think, well, we've had three playoffs, we've had some great runs, we've brought some really good players in, we've just missed out, and let's go again and do it the next time. And and that's what we did. Yeah, absolutely. There was, I say I don't remember there being any sort of um, grumbles in the stands or anything like that. As you say, exactly. Like it. it just seemed to be a big united club, really, that it was eventually, hopefully, going to happen. But you said about earlier about not not being able to coach it any different way. Um, but was there ever any thought about changing a philosophy um, in terms of you know, mixing it up and going long or something like that? Or was it, it was going to be my way, we're going to win it this way? Well, my way is not always the same way. Bobby mm. Robson's way wasn't always the same way. Uh, what you're trying to do is improve players and get a system which suits that group of players. You know? But you've still got to be able to pass the ball whether it's short or long, you know, <laughs> you still got to be able to control it. You well, you'd, got... you'd, you'd be surprised some of the players I've seen in the last few years, but yeah, no, I, I take exactly well, what you mean. Well, I mean, you're not, not in our team because we did it no, every no. day. We did it every day, you know, we, we worked at it every day. So, you know, whether some players think, oh, well, we did the same training, repetition. So we, you've got the belief of passing the ball, getting the ball, Vino, John, Mar- yeah. Jim and Jilton, whatever, get it, get it to feet, play. So you just keep it going. So you sometimes you've got to tweak it. Sometimes I played with a back three. Sometimes with a back four. So I could change it so the players could adjust to systems. There's yeah. nothing wrong with systems, but you've got to adjust and bring the best. Sometimes the opposition are played with one up front. I would maybe go with a back four. If there were two strikers, it was back, back three. So I, I was able to change it because of the players I've got, you know. So it's not black and white. So you've got to adjust. But the actual philosophy of having the basics in the game never changes. And that's down to a lot of repetition and doing it and being positive, you know. Positive where the way you play, not going back, square across, where I think times you think, come on. You know, you, you've got to have the vision to know to turn them. You know, I always think about one Paul Scholes. I mean, you know, forward, Jim Magilton, he'd get the ball. He, he, would, he would want to pass it forwards. You know, not kick it forward, but go and pass it forwards because you've got, you've got the vision before you get the ball. There's too many players just pass it back because they don't have the vision to know what's around them. You know, that's what I think. Well, why did you not turn with the ball there? Yeah. You know, you know and that's someone coaching. I'd be going, hey, come on. You don't just turn with the ball and play and slide it forward. So um, that, that's the philosophy. So you're not changing it. You need the basics, but it can change depending on of, of your personnel and who you're against. And, and you say about systems, a different system and moving from back threes to back fours or fives, whatever. But and we'll talk about some players in a sec. You, you need to have this. And, it, and that's during matches as well, you know, in, in game. And you you need to have intelligent players to allow you to do that, don't you? And I say, well, we'll chat about a couple of those in a sec. So in 1999, 2000s, where we're up to now, we sold Kieran Dyer for £6 million in the summer. Um, he was always going to leave, wasn't he? He was, he was too good to be playing Division One yeah. football at that time, wasn't he? 
Yeah, I mean, Kieran uh, had great ability, great energy. You know, he'll, he'll tell you he played all over the park for us because he was so good. Um, so there, there, there was, you know, it's like some, most players, there comes a time where they want to go or the club comes in for them. And, and that was Kieran. And Kieran, Kieran had, you know, knew Sir Bobby, of course, um, and Charlie. Um, so they were very keen to, to take them. And um, it was a case of we couldn't turn that off or down and we had to build again. And it was good for Kieran because um, he wanted to, to move on into the Premiership. We were in the Premiership there to a big club like Newcastle. So unfortunately, that, that is uh, life. And um, Kieran, you know, learned his trade at Ipswich, which, uh, you know, I still speak to him now and again. I think he enjoyed that. And um, it was a big challenge for him going to Newcastle. Yeah. But again, it lets you build the squad and, and add to the squad and supplement the squad. So you've got Jermaine Wright coming in, John McGrill you spoke about earlier, Gary Crofts coming in, and it's sort of those lot unsung players, but those add into people like Jamie Clapham, who was already in the team. They're the sort of players that allow you to move mm. systems during a match. They're clever players, intelligent guys who can play a number of positions. Yeah. You know, at the, at the flick of a flick of a switch. Yeah. It's important you're not trying to get players something they can't do. Yeah. yeah that, that's the worst scenario. You know, um, these players can, you say, they can drop back or they can push into midfield or they can play with free. So they're intelligent players and they've got uh, the cap- capability to do that. So as a manager, that's great. Sometimes you don't have that, so you can't change it. So, but when the, the, those type of players are, and we could adjust and, the, and it worked uh, well as time went on. And then in February, we signed a guy called Marcus Stewart. How on earth did you manage to persuade Huddersfield, who were, I think, one position below us in fifth? We were fourth. How on earth did we manage to prize him away from them? Well, I think you need to ask them that. But, (laughs) you know, he's he's fantastic for us. Um, Really, when you look at his goal scoring, um, he's always a a clever mover he his, his runs he's um how, how he gets away from defenders in the box he, he will go one way and then the other way he can score with his head score with either foot um he was a fantastic buy for us and he played a big part of course on uh, promotion that year and and um something you need it's not easy to get um we come up with the money for uh, to Huddersfield and accepted and then um, that was um, good for us yeah, brilliant. Another player we had on loan that year was Martin Royser, who technically must be right up there in terms of his, his ability, but a, an interesting character. Was he the most dedicated of trainers as well? Martin was a great lad. Oh, he was enthusiastic, um, great great feet, great ability. Yeah, and and you know, it was one of these, uh, the pace of the game in England is very difficult for. And if you look at Dutch football compared to English, it's completely yeah. different. But uh, Martin certainly did really well for us. You need players who can um, come on, which he did a few times near the end of that season, uh, uh, during that season, and do well for you. And he did. So there's no doubt that uh, you knew that um, you had Martin there. You know, you might start with him then again. He would be very good off the bench uh, because of his ability to score goals and the talent he's got. Yeah, and he's another guy that's gone into coaching, isn't he? He's doing doing well in the in the Dutch um, setup in terms of the, the coaching yeah, side of things. Uh, he was a, ma- a smashing lad, always smile on his face and uh, enthusiastic, and um, I'm, I hope he does well. Yeah, and we only lost four of our and again another run. Lost four of our last twenty eight games, finished in third, two points behind Man City, only four points off off the top. So we head up onto the uh, into the Bolton semi finals. 35 minutes into the first leg, George, we've lost Tony Mowbray. He's gone off injured. David Johnson's gone off injured. We're 2-0 down. It's all over, isn't it, for a, for another year? Well, yeah, it was beginning to look um, that way. Um, but in football, it can change quickly. And, and we, you know, Marcus come up trumps. And um, that's what you need. You need goal scorers. You need yeah. to people to change their ways. Things can go against you. But... Um, we had plenty of things that went against us in the other playoffs over the years. And you think to do that, to be where we were in the fourth year again, was phenomenal. All the, the success and win rates we had. 
but uh, we needed somebody to give us a, a chance. So once we got the first goal, we think, oh well, let, let's get them back to Portman Road and, and Marcus come up trumps again. Yeah, he re- repaid the outlay in, in February, certainly, didn't he? And it's, in terms of that second leg, have you ever been involved in a crazier, crazier <laughs> match than uh, than the Bolton second leg? They were all, you know, they were all correct uh, refereeing decisions as far as we're concerned. But in terms of the toing and froing of the match, it was a crazy old night, wasn't it? Well, I don't, I don't think um, Sam Allardyce. <laughs> well, we still hardly spoke to us since. I think. But, oh well. Uh, well. when I look at back, I think um, definitely two were clear cut. One was maybe fifty fifty, but end of the day, you know, um, we won it. Um, we got through. We played well on the night. Jim McJilton was unbelievable, and um, thankfully we we got the breaks and um, the decisions where eventually over those years we deserved and managed to win it. But um, it was a game I don't think you'll ever see the likes of ever again at, at Portman Road with the emotions and standing there and watching extra time. Really, it was it was stressful to watch, and um, I think the crowd will, will never forget that game. I think it's it's top of the list on so so many fans is um, you know top top games they've ever seen. Understandably, it's a, a ridiculous game, and then obviously we move on to on to Wembley, which eventually you know the scoreline look looks okay, doesn't it? But there were a few heart stopping moments over the, of the course of the day and of the course of the game. What, have you got any particular memories of the of the final itself? Having you know there can't be many people who've played for a club. And managed the same club at uh, at Wembley. Yeah, oh, it was a very emotional day, of course. I mean, um, I think both sets of fans were fantastic. Um, it was a great day, great game to watch for the neutrals. A game it seesawed a little bit, could have went one way, then another. Um, penalty save was maybe a crucial one for us, but on the day I thought we deserved it. Uh, played well. I had to change uh, David Johnson fairly early on, and Richard Naylor come on and was unbelievable. Um, Tony Mowbray getting his header. Um, Marcus, of course, great goal as well with Bam Bam making that cross, and uh, Martin Russa finishing it all off, and uh, Martin Martin Russa style. And uh, I can remember. Uh, jumping up with my my best man, best friend Dale. Um, so those memories will always stay by me. Yeah, fantastic, absolutely brilliant. So that's it then. We're we're in the Premier League or the Premiership. I don't know what it was called called back then. Um, any fears going into the into the season of Premier Premier League? We we only really signed Martin Reuter and Herman Hrydison. So you're keeping yeah that, that again keeping the squad together, just adding. Very, very yeah. little to it. Yeah, well, well the playoffs, uh, you didn't have much time to think about it. Yeah, of course. Straight in. Uh, you're going into it and th- we're really, not really apprehension, but not sure what's going to happen. Uh, in the Premiership, you've, we've got a strong squad, which has been built up over uh, four or five years. Um, settled squad, added Herman to it, uh, really. Um, and and really see how it went. Just play the same. We didn't play any different. We kept with principles, uh, with standards, with beliefs, and um, went into it. And I think um, it was a case. I think Tony had retired. Yeah. Uh, um, and we, we we sort of changed it a little bit. Um, we had Titus Bramble coming into that sort of position, a young lad, seventeen. Um, to play uh, in the squad, so really it was. It was see how we go, and it was going to important. We got off to a half decent start because I think when it's in the Premiership, if you fall behind, it's very yeah. difficult. And so we, we we wanted to get a good start, and uh, we looked at some of the fixtures dauntingly, really thinking oh, Arsenal and Man U. But um, yeah, we weren't wary. But it was one of these things. How can we cope and just go and do our best? Well, but and how important was that? I think the first home game of the season was the Manchester United draw when they had, you know, they got Beckham, Keane, Scholes and Giggs yeah. in their team. But just to give you that, just to settle some nerves and to just give you a bit of confidence that actually we can hold our own here. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember the first few games. Man United was a big game and Arsenal was a big game and we drew with both of them. Yeah. And so, well, they're the two of the best teams in the league and we've caught with them. So let's push on and um, and take one game at a time. You've got to do that in the Premiership and and the players showed that they can cope with it. They can cope with it, your Beckhams and your, your top players and, um, and perform very well. We still had a lot of confidence, we felt, from there and um, kept the same same way going. And the players, you know, like Titus that came in, uh, did really well. Yeah. And Matt, Matt Holland references the 3-0 away at, at Everton as one of his you know, standout games that year, that year, that season, and being applauded off by the Everton yeah. fans at the end of the match. Yeah, I remember that game well. Cause it was a game because Walter Smith was the manager, and I know Walter. Scottish line, of course, fairly, fairly well, and it was a game where, you know, we 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 set our stall down, but we knew we could change it. So as the game goes on, uh, Walter, well, I think we got took the lead or whatever. It wasn't going well for them, so he changed it, and then when he changed it, I changed it, and this went on, and we went <laughs> to two 0 and then it went on, and it went to three 0 and then he looked over to me, and he, he sort of went. He came after again. Yeah, every time you ch- I changed it, you've changed it, and you were better. <laughs> and going to Everton to outplay them and manipulating the team, which we did, yeah. was great. And I remember Matt coming in at half time laughing, Matt Holland. And I said to Matt, What are you laughing at? You know, we we're winning and we we're quite. Oh, he says, Gaza. He says, Why are you lazy in the Gaza? I said, He keeps looking at his shirt. And I said to him, why, why are you looking at your shirt? He says, well, I've got your number on my shirt, so I remember who, who to mark here. <laughs> the number he eight. He actually wrote number eight, Matt Holland in his shirt, so he remembered <laughs> who to mark from my corner. <laughs> yeah, bless him. Bless him. Yeah, the number eight's a bit too difficult, poor old Gazza. Um, so, December, we beat Liverpool away. Again, um, Marcus Stewart at that time. Draw at home to Chelsea. Beat Tottenham 3-0. You know, these are, these are all solid Premier League teams that we're not brushing aside, but we know we're getting some great results against them. Southampton, 3-0 away, the hat-trick by Marcus Stewart. Yeah. He was, should he have been called up for England? He was good enough for England, wasn't he, at that point in time? Well, his record spoke for itself, um, but there was a lot of decent um, strikers in England, of course, you know, yeah. cheerers and all that, but um, his record was second to none. You know, he, his goal scoring in that time of the season and, and that, that year was as good as any, so he could easily have been called up and maybe deserved to. Yeah. So in terms of the, the squad itself, was there any, like, disbelief that this was going so well? The morale must have been absolutely through the roof. You know, the guys must have been buzzing in training. The, the team's just on a roll. I suppose it just ends up coaching itself and picking itself, does it? No, well, it doesn't. Because you've got to keep the same standards and you've got to keep on top of them and you've got to keep the same beliefs, you know, and um, we always believe it's working. Like, you know, usually after a session, we always players like I did, whatever, doing extra and Tony Mowbray would go and work a bit with the back three or back four. I would say to Tony, go and do a little bit with them. And to- so Tony would keep on top of that and we're, we're working on this. So, it, you know, it, you've got to keep that continuity going. You can't just take your foot off the pedal. Uh, we didn't, you know, when I was a player over those years, and we tried to keep it going. Um, we know that we didn't have a big squad, so we we're fairly fortunate with injuries. We didn't have too many, and um, um, the first season in the Premiership certainly gave everybody a lift, you know. Yeah. And it was one of these, whoa, we're in the Premiership, wow, we're winning, and everybody was felt ten foot tall. But and it was a case of keep keeping it going. Yeah, this just goes to show, doesn't it? I suppose that that. Momentum, you know, people use the word momentum all the time, doesn't it? And having, as you said at the very beginning, having not got off to a bad start, you know, you, you just start to build and build over the course of a season, don't you? It's, it's a remarkable thing. It's, uh, yes, yes. Confidence. Oh, confidence is the utmost. You, that's why you've got to, be a, got to have a strong character so that when things are not going well, you don't lose it all. I mean, you're seeing now players like in Man United, you think, poor lad's lost his confidence. And yeah. when that happens... You know, you, you lose, you know, all your ability. So that confidence is, is, um, it's got to try and stick there all the time. And famously, we finished fifth with with three points off of third and four points off of second. Um, 
narrowly missing out on the Champions League, <laughs> remarkably. Um, and yourself, personally, you win, obviously you win the Premier League Manager of the Year, but you win the League Managers Association Manager of the Year, um, you know, the, the best manager in, in the country. It doesn't get much better than that, does it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a phenomenal. It's still the best finish from any team. It's got promotion. But I still think sometimes the team doesn't get, you know, the recognition it deserves, you know. Of course, Bobby's teams were great. But, for, you know, to, to finish fifth at that period, um, just been there, it was a phenomenal achievement. And it was a great team. It was a fantastic team. And, um, you know, a team that um, was built up and a team that, that played great football, you know, and it wasn't luck, and we were in sort of third position for a lot of that season. Yeah. So um, yeah, it, it was something. Everything went right, and um, and it was you know all those years of building and building and 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 trying to improve, and and players reached a peak, you know. Yeah. They, they reached a peak, and the first season, I think the Premiership is great, you know, because you you're at your peak and you want to stay there. You know, to keep it there, it's not, sometimes not so easy. Yeah, well, yeah, as, as we'll find out. In, in, as your stock was so high, were there any ever, ever whispers from anywhere else, any other clubs? Um, yeah, I could, have moved, I could have moved to other clubs. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to move. <laughs> when I want to move, it's my club. You know, yeah. it's my player. I love David Sheepshanks aboard, everybody. Um was great. Um, and um, I enjoyed working with the group of players we had. I had no, yeah, there was, yeah, no thought of moving. Um, but uh, as I say, maybe I should have done. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, unfortunately, but we there you to... go. That's the life. I wanted to stay, and I did. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And well, unfortunately, we'll have to talk about it. So, summertime, we sold, as you said earlier. Richard Wright went off to Arsenal. Jamie Scowcroft went off to Leicester. We recoup. Nine million pound for those two guys, um, and we brought in a couple of players who weren't probably normal Ipswich transfers, should we say? Um, Matteo Serini and Fanidi George. How how did those transfers come about? Because you know, as you showed with the the Herman Hryderson signing, it was guys who'd already sort of knew the league yeah. um, and knew the country, etc., knew the football. But how did the Serini and um, Fanidi George transfers? Yeah, happen? I mean. I mean, Richard Wright left, uh, which we didn't. Um, as I said previously, he had money in his. Uh, he moved to and went to Arsenal. That was a big loss. We tried to get a couple of other players, goalkeepers in England. Uh, one of them from Arsenal um, got injured, um, so we, we couldn't get him. There was Mark Poom, was it from Derby Mark as well? Poom. Yeah, he he had a wrist. Injury. Oh, yeah. okay. I tried to sign him, but he was injured, and I've always liked him. And then I went abroad and watched um, um, the keeper, and then he did well on the day. He came back, we signed him. He did well for a month, and then I think his his attitudes and his, you know, he kept blaming everybody, and and it didn't work out. So it wasn't a good buy. I took a risk where. Others, I was trying to get, I couldn't. So, you know, I, I don't think everybody's 100% there, but it wasn't, <laughs> it didn't work out. So, it didn't work out, and and he wasn't a great for the team uh, around the dressing room. Uh, from there, Fanini George, everybody talks about it. And, and Fanini, I seen over and playing for Mallorca, we were looking for a wide midfield player that could score goals. And I thought Fanini could do that with his history, and I spoke a few people over in Holland as well and he came in he, and he started off really well and, but eventually he couldn't cope with the pace of the game the pace was too quick for him you know people say did I know his age before I bought him but I don't think he knew his age <laughs> anyway. so it didn't work out but he had, did have the ability so some of those signings didn't work out uh, the way we'd hoped to improve the team I think if we'd have finished um, if we'd have got relegated the first season, uh, third bottom, like we did that season, nobody said, oh, we're unlucky. But because we finished fifth, I tried to improve the team yeah. with better players and foreign players, and it didn't w- work out that way. Um, and some of the players who did really well 
on the first season, found it difficult to keep to that level the second season. Yeah. Plus, is the European scenario where yeah. you're playing on the Thursday and then playing the Sunday and then the Thursday. And we did very well in Europe. We won in Moscow. We won in Sweden. You know, yeah. we were you know you know we we beat Milan first one nil then lost away. So that went well, but it, it definitely took his eye off the ball for the for the games. Yeah. You know, games in the Premiership. Uh, you know, and we didn't have the, the, the strength of squad that your top five and six normally do. So it was a, a mixture of, you know, mate, some of the buy, buys didn't work out. One or two players couldn't quite perform, which have done fantastic the year before. Um, the European scenario didn't work. And we, we finished, as you say, as I say, third bottom in the last game against Liverpool to get relegated, which was a big blow considering the season before. Um, for the club, um, but um, the Premiership is a very, very difficult league, and uh, the European scenario didn't do us any favours. Yeah, it would exactly as you say. It's it's um, as we spoke about when we were talking about the first year up there in terms of getting on a roll and, and getting the confidence under your belt early doors. That is something that unfortunately we weren't able to do um, in that season, was it? I think we'd only got we got the derby win where Fanidi played spectacularly well in that in that home game. That was pretty much. The one win in the first two or three months, as you say, it's it's mm-hmm. if you get on the on the slip side, you know, the, on the flip side of the the good roll, it's trying to get it back from a from a bad yeah. one, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, and you, you know, people, you know, we did well in Europe, people, but that didn't come into consideration. But there's a lot yeah. of fans in there who still talk about going over to Milan and hundred percent, yeah. And the, That's and it. The, I know, you know, the Moscow. Not many teams win in Moscow, but um, yeah, as I say, it, it was. Yeah, it was very disappointing, and uh, like anybody, but um, it is it is a league where you've really got to have got to be on top of everything to to compete in. Yeah, and funnily enough, you're talking about Inter Milan. When when I saw you at a, a Q and A you did in my neck of the woods in uh, September time, I think it was. There was a there was a Colts United fan in the in the crowd, and he asked you with a straight face. He asked you if there, you'd had any regrets about leaving Colts United. <laughs> You know, when you were standing on the touchline at the San Siro watching your team, you know, one nil up from the first leg, were you were, you, were the thoughts of Leia Road regret in the in the back of your mind? Well, you got you got to say he's a true Colchester fan. <laughs> he's blinded by it. You know, well, you, you can't knock it, can you? No, absolutely. But, but in my perspective, it's, it's, it's sort of you know one one I'll never forget, and one I'll you know when I walk about town, town I live in Ipswich. Um, when I walk about town, everybody's talking about you know playoffs, talking about you know Europe, uh, and it's memories that um, certainly they won't forget. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So in ter- in terms of um, main regrets, you know, with 2020 hindsight, would you have done anything different? Were there any transfers that almost got over the line and and we weren't quite able to um, you know to, to seal the deal on? I know. Um, the guy Cashelaw, wasn't it from Coventry? Was he at the time or Southampton? Maybe. Yeah. He ended, well, up, yeah. ended up joining Villa, I think, last last moment. But yeah. with it, and you said about Mark Poom as well. But they're the sort of players that already played in England, hadn't they? They'd already yeah. used to the football, etc. Yeah. Et yeah. Second thoughts. Yeah. You, second thoughts. You think, well, I shouldn't have taken that gamble, and, and that's right. You know, I shouldn't have took that gamble and and moved on to somebody who's played. But you know, when you're trying, Mark. When I'm trying to improve some a team that finished fifth, you're, yeah. you're trying to bring somebody with international maybe experience, you know? Yeah. Fanini George who, who played in the world, you know, there who's been Ajax and you know, the Italian goalkeeper, which yeah. didn't work out. Um and and we talk, I talked about Mauricio, it took a season for them or so to settle down. Yeah. It, it takes longer for them to settle down in this country. But um as I say I, Hold my hands up um, as far as th- th- those transfers not going right. Um, but you had plenty of credit in the bank, though. Sure. But over the years, I think if you look at the transfers up to that season, they, they, they did fantastically well. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. And then a sort of double whammy, wasn't it? In that in that summer, in that there was the was it ITV Sport or Digital collapsed or one of the yeah, sports yeah. channels collapsed yeah, in it. Yeah. We were pretty much immediately hit by financial yeah, yeah. Um, issues, weren't we? So Titus went off to went off to Newcastle. 
Uh, I think Serini went back out on loan to to Italy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the season didn't start off too badly uh, in Division One. Again, we won first two matches, but they lost yeah. a few on the trot. And then come Grimsby, we were three 0 lost to Grimsby, and 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 that was it. Were you confident you could have still turned things round or had things yeah, under course? I, mean, I think so. I mean, when you look uh, um, the. The divisions, the team, teams that get relegated usually struggle yeah. early on. Um, so, so and, and we had, we had still a fairly strong team. Again, we were playing in Europe. Again, we, yeah. we, were, we were playing Thursday. Again, Thursday we're off to Europe and then play, play, playing on a Sunday um, early on in that season. And we were still in it. We won games in that. So it wasn't a great start, but, um, you know, that, that was there. I mean... Um, I think I think it was a big shock for a lot of the the squad getting relegated, and it was going to take time to, to turn around. And but sometimes in football you, you don't get it, but um, I was still confident that um, yeah, it was early on the season. It was only October. We're still playing in Europe, um, yeah. and 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 certainly it was plenty of time to turn it around. That's ridiculous, wasn't it? That we were through through the fair play league, we managed yeah. to get back into Europe again. It must have been a Bizarrely, just the one thing that we didn't re- particularly require, wasn't it? The year after? I've, all, I've always believed in a, a disciplined team, you know, uh, wherever I've been. And I think we've got Europe because of that, because we're a disciplined team. Yeah. And that's something I was brought up with Bobby Robson and the coaches. You've got to be disciplined. And, and that's the way our teams were. So having walked in the door as a 38-year-old, relatively inexperienced manager, to leave having managed over 400 games and, the, as I said before, the third most matches in our history, it must give you, well, have given and still give you just tremendous pride. Yeah, I mean, I, I was very disappointed, like everybody else, about um, the club getting into administration, um, you know, and, and the club were great. But, you know, there was a conversation in the summer where, you know, we, to sell players, uh, you know, and that, when before I've always had to sell players, and I think uh, you say Tyson, went and there was offers for Matt Holland and Herman the Raiders and a couple of others we could have sold to stop it. It wouldn't have happened. Um, but I think the new transfer window come in as well. Of course, yeah. when, when they didn't decide not to um, sell the players, which they could have done, which I've done all my career, it was too late then for, for the club. Um, so that was a big disappointment for me because I was... I couldn't believe it when I, I heard about it. So, so that that was a difficult one for the club, which um, could have been avoided. Um, no doubt about that. Uh, but that that that's life. And with the, you say with the, the money not coming in as much, and with it with the transfer window come in, it made things difficult for the club. So, before we briefly go over the rest of your management career, have you, have you ever been close to coming back since? No, I mean, um, no, I've been, you know, a, a number of um, clubs which I've enjoyed. Um, I've I always wanted to come back and live here. Um, but, you know, it was one of these where you leave a club and then you look to go um, to different clubs. And I've never had the offer to come back here. So that, that hasn't happened. So, as you say about other clubs, you had two full seasons at Derby and got those to fourth, where they were relegation candidates the, the season before. Yeah. He got them in, got them into the playoffs. Yeah. Um, yeah that, a... that was great. I really enjoyed that. I'd, um, the back room wasn't so great uh, why I left. Um, it was a bit frightening, really. And then two of the executives end up in prison. Really? Um, so, but I really enjoyed it there. That's a very similar club to um, Ipswich. Yeah. Um, bringing young players through, Tom Huddleston. Um, you say they were, I, I took the caretaker job on first and kept him up, and then we end up getting the playoffs uh, two seasons later, and and we actually, you know, got very close to to the to it. So um, I really enjoyed it there, and a lovely club, and um, the fans were fantastic there. Yeah, they're in a spot of bother now, unfortunately, aren't they as well? Yeah. Um. And you say about backroom uh, at Derby, you, you moved on to Hearts and yeah. Crikey. Of, of, what what a start you had! A, you won eight of your first ten league yeah, games. Yeah. You were 
flying at the at the top of the league. Um, but yeah, there was a, a an issue. Was there in the, a bit of meddling? Was there in the background? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I loved it there. Um, fans, I mean, unbelievable the fans, and um, it was strange to start with because um, didn't have a strong squad, and I found it difficult to sign a player because uh, Mister Robinoff. Um, you couldn't really contact or he would um, say, no, if I want to play now, he's not good enough, he's not good enough. And, <laughs> you know, so it was difficult. And my chief scout, um, Simon Hunt, um, knew some agents over who spoke Russian and then eventually got people at Rudy Scatchel and that in there and, and got a good team together. And, um, and then he was... Uh, not still not happy with it, and he didn't like this. And um, then he brought this player in who came for a trial, and I said, "No, nah, he's not good enough. The players don't like him either, whatever." And then he turned up the next day on the three-year contract. <laughs> so it was a difficult one, but it was it wasn't going to be right. And then then I left, um, having done so well, and so um, it was short, short and sweet, I would say. Yeah, and it's still it's still spoken about by the Hearts fans now in terms of what yeah, well, what could have, what could have been. It was, it was a great rapport, and we'd, we 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 had the chance of winning the league with the team we had, and uh, we had some good, very good professionals. It was great to see Craig Gordon uh, still playing, still playing away there, and he he you know he was the best goalkeeper I ever worked with, and unbelievable how he stopped playing for about three years, and then he came back, and he's going to be playing you know with Scotland in the World Cups, so um, yeah. yeah, and he's still playing with Hearts, so um, no, he's great, but uh, it was a great club, great. It was never going to last long, put it that way. I've been brought up a certain way of being a manager. Times have changed, even a lot of clubs now of um, controlling it, um, and, and that wasn't going to happen. And then you moved on to Southampton a couple of months yeah. later, and Sir Clive yeah. Woodward yeah. was was there at the time. What what was his involvement? Because it was yeah. at a time where he was of the opinion that you know you could take you know rugby or just sport yeah. characteristics and take it into any sort of sport. Around. Yeah. Again, I really enjoyed it. Rupert Lowe was the chairman, yep. um, and he 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 brought the youth system and worked really hard with it. And we brought some great players through. I mean, Gareth Bale, or Adam Lallana, um, you know, you would uh, best uh, David Best, um, David McGoldrick, who was which is of course David. Yep. I gave David his debut seventeen along with Adam Lallana. Um, you know, a number of others and Gareth, and um, yeah, he, he did well, and um, he, he knew Woodworth well, Clive Woodworth, and um, he said, Well, oh, we'd like to bring him in. I said, Fine, great, and he was a really nice fellow, Clive. Um, what and he he had the belief more the belief in bringing certain people in for certain things, you know, for, for your diet, for you know, fitness, okay. and yeah, so bringing the best people in. And um, I think it was keen, keen in doing a bit of coaching and things like that. Wasn't it? But every time I asked him, we went, no, I think I'll leave that alone, Josh. Ah, uh, really? <laughs> so he never interfered, but he was really good and he had some really good ideas. Um, he was only there for a short period because um, Rupert Lowe left. He didn't get on with the fans. And then I had two or three other chairmen there who were really nice people, uh, good people, um, and, and enjoyed it. And as I say, the youth policy and the kids were brought through again suited me, you know. Yeah. You know, Gareth was fantastic, you know. Well, yeah, well, so let's let's talk about Gareth Bale then. So, it, you know, is there, how easy is it to spot a player in their early years and know that, you know, obviously they've got to put in the tough, the hard work themselves, but how easy is it to spot that that player is going to make it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of these good players in the academy, people in the academy know about, you know. They do. Yeah. You can see, you know, the, the coaches that can see you guy, you know, and, and uh, Southampton, really good academy. So it's a case of once you have them, it's getting the best out of them. And some people say, oh, well, just play them two or three times and give them a rest. You don't want to play them for too long and all that. Well, I'm, I'm not a believer in that. Of course, you've got to keep an eye on them. But once they're there and they're still looking good, you want to, you know, work with them, give them that. I was given the opportunity to play regular, and Gareth was the same. He was only 17, brought him in, never looked back. I mean, as an attacking fullback and a left foot, then he was second to none. I mean, when you played opposition, the opposition used to mark him 
to stop him getting the ball because he was so good and he's so quick. So he was at left back there and he was in fun, fun about talent, um, working hard. He was always the last off the training ground, working in his free kicks. You know, great, great vision, great left foot, gets forward. Maybe he wasn't the toughest lad in the world as far as tackling that, but brilliant at going forward. And, um, you know, everybody's seen how it went. And I actually went to Tottenham and he struggled the first few months, six months, because I was, you know, I was Scotland manager and watched him a few times and he was struggling a little bit. And then he moved forward and he, he took off again. But uh, he was great to work with, uh, along with Adam Lallana was a wee bit behind. He wasn't quite quite ready at 17. <laughs> I'm still talking about 17. He got the first team with 18, you know, and David McGoldrick was the same. But these are young kids, you give the opportunity. People say, oh, he's young, he's only 21. Come on. Yeah, you know, he's not that young. You yeah. know, I'm a believer. Once they get in that age, if they're not playing regular in the first team, they need to be out low or they'll be in your first team. So, you know, you're talking about some good, top quality players there who have enjoyed developing and they've all international players, which is great to see. And we had Kieran and Titus, all interna- internationals now. You know, not, not just ordinary players, international players who've came through the Youth Academy uh, which and Southampton where I've been working. Yeah, it must just give you immense pride that pick, to pick out these, as you say, 17-year-olds and see them just yeah. progress and progress and progress yeah, to the Tom, height, the very, very highest level. Tom Huddleston was the same. You know, he was, for me, he was a Glenn Hoddle pass of the ball. You know, I seen him come on and sub for Hull the other day. He's still playing, yeah. He's a great pass. I used to enjoy watching him. You know, sometimes you stand by and think, oh, how did you see that pass? And I loved that, you know, great vision. I, I used to work in drills to give people better vision passing the ball, you know. It doesn't just come. Sometimes you've got to give them drills so they can see different passes of the ball, which is important. Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. Well, as you, as you said about being manager of Scotland, you were obviously had, had your period up there. You must, again, massive pride to, to manage your country. Yeah. How easy was it to persuade Terry Butcher to... Uh, to join you? Yeah, I mean, leaving Southampton wasn't easy because, you know, but they had some problems because I said they had two or three different chairmen. You think, well, do I stay? Yeah. I got on well with them with the chief exec called Lee Hoos, who's at uh, Queen's Park Rangers now. I got on really well with them. But I thought, if you're going to be offered the job, I've got to go for it. Yeah. And, um, and it's a different type of job where you're not in the coaching role much you only have them a few times you know every month and, yeah. and i found it difficult you know and you see i wanted some people i knew terry had been in scotland with rangers for a long time he's a good friend of mine he was brought up with me at portland road so you know i wanted terry to i think he thought twice about it <laughs> um but he he, he accepted it and um you know so that was great but um it was a difficult job and one it wasn't really great for me to get enjoyment working with players in the training grounds, and yeah, because uh, you can't change them. You're only you know you know you're not actually working the technique once yeah. a month or once every two months. Um, so yeah, that was difficult, and the results didn't go great. My first game against um, one of the first games against Argentina, and Maradona was a manager. Oh, right. So uh, you can imagine what the Scottish press was saying to Terry about that. <laughs> They're rubbing that in, bless him. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it, it's, it, it, it was difficult and the results didn't go well. And we, you know, my wife and myself, we moved up to Edinburgh, which we really enjoyed. Um, so that, that was good, but it, it wasn't something I, I enjoyed getting out in the training ground and working with players and. And Matt Hall and tell you working the, where, where, where they're going to get better and working in the past and day in and day out. And uh, but it was it was a privilege, you know. I played every level for my country and then managed my country. So um, as Manti says, it's not bad for a wee boy coming from Cumnock, you know. So that is good. Brian Pan signing going back to the uh, <laughs> yeah exactly to the previous <laughs> chat. Absolutely fantastic. So just bringing things a little bit more up to date. You, you're playing plenty of golf at the moment. You, as you, we spoke off off air, you know, you've got your son-in-law at uh, Milton Keynes Dons at the moment, doing fantastically well. Is he calling up for plenty of advice? Yeah, I go to quite a few of the games. I mean, I've I've been to most of all the home games at Ipswich for the last eight years. 
um, playing a bit of golf and um, go to the gym, yeah, and try and get a few holidays in. You know, still, as I say, go down to Ipswich, you know, from there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I've seen Mark you know, Ashton for about two seconds when I was down at Terry Butcher was uh, at Portman Road getting into the Hall of Fame of England. He said he'd, you know, have a chat with us and introduce us to the chairman and and the owners, but um, that never happened. So um, I'm still I'm still going and watching and enjoying the games. Yeah, well, uh, funnily enough, actually, let's talk about modern day Ipswich briefly before we go. At the Q&A I was at, as I spoke about earlier in September, you said at the time, actually back in September, that you weren't overly keen on this strategy of bringing in 20 brand new players and, you know, completely scrapping a squad of players. In in terms of squad building, how quickly, realistically, could could can that be done? I think Ipswich has got a really good squad. I think the selection has been good for the first division. Um, they've got so many different alternatives, two or three players for every position. Yeah, I think very good. I think the last few years, uh, the form- formation they've played hasn't suited the players. We've talked a bit, you know, round pegs, square holes, jigsaw puzzle. They haven't, they've had the squad, but they haven't got the best out of them. Um, I think John McGreal come in and changed it after two games. Uh, Kevin, you know, can't, you know, has come in and and it looks good. I think they've, you know, adjusting it to that three at the back, suits the players, the midfield, two up front. I think, yeah, they're getting it right, uh, which is great. And um, it gives them a chance now. I really yeah. think they'll get in the top six, where I wouldn't, really? I wouldn't have given them a chance a month ago. I think with the squad they've got, I think they've, they've got a good chance, um, that, you know, and um, they're, they're going to get, you know, plenty of good coaching in the training grounds. Uh, they've got a good squad. They've got the finance. I mean, I mean, you look at MK Dons, I think their wage bill is about three million. Ipswich is 10 million. So they've got the finance. They've got the squad. I think they've got a really good coach there. Yeah. Um, I hope he's, you know, uh, he does well and give a full license to, to work with the players. And, and I honestly think now they'll, they'll finish in the top six. What's been phenomenal for me in the last eight years is the fans. I mean, I've been sitting there watching for the last eight years, um, especially since Mick's left. It's, you know, it hasn't been great, to say the least. Uh, but the fans, <laughs> you know, 26,000, 24,000, the atmosphere, and they're putting the referee under pressure <laughs> at home. I find them to win every game. So that's been incredible. And I think a town which used to be vibrant has gone a bit. And it's great that the fans get something to cheer about. And, uh, and yeah. I think they've got a good squad of players. I think they will, for me, get into that top six. Wonderful stuff. Well, here's hoping a eh? fingers crossed. As you say, very, very early doors. But, you know, from what we've all seen from uh, from Kieran McKenna, it's uh, it's looking it's looking encouraging from, from what little we've seen at the moment. So, yeah, fingers crossed. Well, well, George, I think we're done. Um, once more, thank you so much for your time. You've been more than generous with, with your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure all the viewers and listeners will be absolutely fascinated by what you've had to say um, and would finally just like to join me in thanking you for everything that you've done for our club. Thank you very much, George. Take care. Thank you.